We're all glad to be together in this opportunity to study the Bible in the middle of, a, of the week. It's good to take time out. Though we're not together in person, we can at least be together and fellowship one another in this type of techn technology. We're in chapter 10 of the book of John. John chapter 10. I again want to urge you to read each chapter and to again be reminded that John is proving that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is deity. He is the Son of God. He does this differently from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Holy Spirit, in inspiring him, caused him to select different people, if you please, as witnesses, including the Lord himself, as we noticed last week. But we'll see more coming now in chapter 10. Notice, and we'll continue to do this as we've done, trying to be very factual and state the facts. He says, I am the door into the cheap fold. What's he up to? Well, we all know what a door is. It is a place to enter, a proper place to enter, a room or something like that, or to leave it. In this case, he says, the one who does not enter by the door, remember he's the door, but climbs up some other way, is a thief and a robber. I want you to notice how, he, how we're taking these uh, specific truths that Jesus uttered and stating them. He then says the one who enters by the door, we, we could say the gate, is the shepherd of the sheep. Now he expands on this. He says, to him, the porter or the doorkeeper opens. The next thing is, he says, the sheep hear his voice. Then he calls his sheep by name and leads them out. Then he says, he takes all his own and he walks before them, or he goes before them. The next thing is that the sheep follow him because they know his voice. He declares plainly that a stranger they will not follow, but they'll run from him. Now, of course, this was the type of thing that these people were very familiar with all their lives. They knew how that the flocks and herds were taken care of and they were put up at night in most cases into a pen we would say and there was someone who guarded that pen against wolves or whatever it might be thieves and then the shepherd would come open the door and lead them out to pasture I think a good commentary on this is David's own Psalm 23, of which we're very familiar. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, so on. But Jesus said, I am the door. He didn't say I'm one of many doors. He said, I'm the door. And he says, all who came before me are thieves and robbers. Now he says, if any enter through me, he should be saved. Then he declared, I came that they might have life and might have it abundantly. Uh, think about that for a minute. Jesus didn't come to condemn everyone. It was pointed out in the message a moment ago. Everyone's already condemned because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. And the wages of sin is death, separation from God, Romans 6, 23. Jesus came to save people from their sins. Now Jesus moves to another I am. He says, I'm the door. Now he says, I am the good shepherd. 
what does a good shepherd do? Well, the first fact is this. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Now, hired hand is the next point. He sees the enemy or the wolf coming, and he flees. He leaves the sheep to them. There's no proper love and concern for those sheep. But not so with the good shepherd. He says, I know my own, and my own know me. Thus, he then says, I lay down my life for the sheep. He also says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. Of course, Jesus came in the flesh as a Jew, fulfilling prophecies. And he did his earthly ministry among the Jews primarily. But yet he's giving us an inkling here and should have to the people of his day, even his disciples, though they didn't know yet. But he says, I have other sheep. Well, they would fit the same category as the sheep he's already mentioned. And they would hear his voice and they would follow him. But they weren't of the we could say it now, the Jewish fold, knowing the rest of the New Testament, how even one apostle was called to be the apostle to the Gentiles or non-Jews, that was Paul. But then we know what he meant before the gospel is for all. That old middle wall of petition, which was the law of Moses, has been taken out of the way and nailed to his cross, Colossians 2.14. Of course, they have no idea of this at this time. But I notice he goes further about himself. The Father loves me. Why? Because I lay down my life. Interesting thing he says here, I have authority to lay it down. That's his life. And I have authority to take it up again. Well, this when you get to this point, and again, notice how matter of fact he is, that's the reason we're putting it in this uh, way to present it. I might pause here and add this before I say what I was about to. In striving to get the information out of the text, realizing how we come to learn anything. Well, you might be able to do this mentally. You may have to write it down. You may have to do both. But it's good to go through a text and just look at the facts in it and write them, write them down. And that's how I'm trying to present this. It's one way of, of studying. You can read, and that's good. We ought to read. That gets you more familiar with the text. There's a great amount to be learned just from reading if you understand what you read. But when you're trying to see just exactly what, in this case, the Apostle John is doing, that is offering proof that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, then you want to do more. You want to look and see what Jesus is doing. The old saying, that the, who's he, to whom is he speaking? And then you say, who is he speaking? Who is speaking? What's the subject of consideration? And that helps you pick out the facts in the case. Well, the Jews were beside themselves over this kind of thing. That was too plain for them. It reminds me, and I don't stretch the point, I don't think here, of people who are asking politicians questions that could be answered yes or no, or very factually. And they say everything and answer the question. That is not the answer to the question. They get in whatever they want to say. But Jesus wasn't like that in being the master teacher and presenting himself as the savior of the world. Now, when he encounters these Jews, you'll notice it was the time of the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem. Jesus is walking in the porch or portico of Solomon. Huge, very large place. I won't go into all of that now, but uh, get you a commentary and look up, or as referred to a while ago uh, by Eric, 
uh, the ISBE and look up the temple. Look how it was arranged. Look at the size of the portico, the porches all the way around it. So large place. The temple, actu the actual temple where the worship was done wasn't as big as all of those uh, porches and so forth all the way around it. But he's walking there. And here come the Jews. They all gather around him. Now, what's interesting, think of what he's already done. Think of the miracles that he has already performed. Yet they come up and say, well, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Well, you couldn't get any plainer than he had made it clear that I am who I have said I am. The miracles were worked to prove that he was that. Notice how he responds. Jesus said, I told you, and you do not believe me. Now watch where he focuses. The very works that I do bear witness of me. Now, how did they do that? Well, they had to imply that he was the Son of God. That's what the miracles were designed to do. They were signs. And they pointed to him as God's Son. He says, you don't believe. Notice what he does. He falls back on what he said about him being the door of the sheepfold. He says, you do not believe you are not my sheep. I suppose that's too plain for some people. Well, the Son of God who loved us more than we can comprehend made it clear with your disposition of mind toward me, your lack of willingness to receive the very signs that proved me to be the Son of God. You're not mine. You're not my sheep. Here's why. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life. They're not going to perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. No one's able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And then he says, I and the Father are one. Well, that just poured high test gasoline on already raging fire as far as the Jews' attitude toward him. Let's pause here for a minute and make a rather a somewhat modern day a study of not being able to snatch his sheep out of his hand. Baptist doctrine has long said that once a person is saved, he cannot so sin as to fall from God's grace. Even though you have plain statements such as in Galatians chapter 5 verse 4 he said whosoever you are that are justified by the law ye are fallen from grace they completely ignore the fact that there were many times throughout the whole of the New Testament that the writers dealt with false doctrines and sins some brethren who sinned and so on now, I know why they believe that. But they go to this passage and they'll try to say, see, once you're saved, you can't snatch them out of his hand. Well, there is a perversion of the scriptures. That's it. If you're faithful to God as a member of his son's church, there's no way you can be lost. God won't lie. But that doesn't rule out the fact you can choose to leave it. For whatever reason, you can choose to leave it. So this passage doesn't teach anything at all about once saved, always saved. But when he says, back more to the text, I and the Father are one, notice what they did. The Jews took up stones again to stone him. Look at the setting. 
tell us plainly who you are. Well, he's already done it by his works. He's done it otherwise. I don't know what's going on completely in their minds, but I can tell you right now, they did not have a good and honest heart. Luke 8, 15. Jesus, of course, could know them through and through and through and completely. And notice what he says. He responds to them when they take up stones to stone him. He says, I have shown you. Now, you get that. I've shown you. You have seen. I have shown you have seen. I've shown you many good works from the Father. Then he puts them in a quandary, which didn't do any more than set their teeth on the edge further. He said, for which of these good works do you stone me? Well, the, the Jews said, for a good work, we do not stone you. Now, now think for a minute. Inspiration is infallibly recorded what this bunch of liars said. But what they said is a lie. For a good work, we do not stone you. That's not true. These miracles that he worked, that they were privy to seeing, proved he was a son of God. But they turned it and said, you're speaking against God. We stone you because you're a blasphemer. You, being a man, make yourself to be God. Well, the Lord comes back and says, do you say of him whom the Lord sanctified? Now think, sanctify means to set apart for a given purpose or work. Jesus came into this world to save sinners. He's in the process of doing what he came to do. That is proving he is the Messiah, the Son of God. So he he says plainly, you're the one that's in the wrong. I'm not blaspheming. So do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and said into the world, you're blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God. Well, he continued on. He said, if I do the works of my father, then you believe me. That's what they're there to cause you to be able to do. But then he says, if you, if I don't do the works of my father, then don't believe me. You know really what he's saying? We're taught in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21, as Christians, so we won't get caught up in false doctrine. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. What he's actually saying here, we would put it in those terms that the Holy Spirit had Paul use. He's saying, if I do not prove through adequate evidence and credible witnesses that I am the Messiah, the Son of God, then don't believe me. But if I do prove through working miracles, through credible witnesses, and through the abundant evidence that I'm the Son of God, then believe me. Well, of course, they won't want to hear that. The Jews, therefore, sought to get old him again, but we understand that he eluded their grasp I've always, out of curiosity, want to know why he slipped away and what he did. But uh, nevertheless, he did. And that again says, only at the right time would he be allowed to fall into their hands so they could put him to death. And that was not the time. Now, before we, as we wind up this chapter, the testimony of, of many who knew John the Immerser, the baptizer. Notice that the Lord went again to the place where John was at first, baptizing. 
and he stayed there a while. While he was there, which from Jerusalem, that would be probably, oh, 25 miles, roughly that, down to where the Jordan is. Many came to him. Now, notice what they say. While John performed no sign, no miracle, watch, yet everything John said about this man was true. Scripture says that many believed in him there. So there were those who were honest hearted, who understood that he had proved by his miracles, signs to them, that he truly is the Son of God. And they believed on him. Now remember, John, the apostle, inspired of the Holy Spirit, writing this book, wrote it so he could prove Christ is deity. And looking through this chapter, the Lord said, I am the door to the sheepfold. I am the good shepherd. I am the son of God. What we can conclude for this whole chapter, and as far as evidence offered to prove he is the son of God, all of it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we simply say, let the works speak for themselves. Now, somebody says, well, that was almost 2,000 years ago, and you still believe that? Why shouldn't I? I still believe Julius Caesar did what history says he did. How do I know that? Well, it works and so forth. At least some have been preserved. I still believe in Alexander the Great, so on and so forth. Truth is not lessened because of age. Neither is the evidence that proves Jesus Christ of Nazareth the Son of God. There are many things except in this world that were first discovered many, many years ago. But because they were discovered a long time ago doesn't change their truthfulness. Well, let's move from there. We've got plenty of time to do this. Into chapter 11. Chapter 11. I don't know whether we'll get through with this or not, but there's some 44 verses in it. And we will continue to do as we've done in being factual about what's found in the chapter. And this is the case of where Jesus, our Lord, raised a very good friend of his, Lazarus, from the dead. Now, don't get him confused with the Lazarus of Luke 16, the beggar. Lazarus is the brother of Mary and Martha. From what we can find out about them, they were pretty well-to-do people. But Lazarus became ill. And the sisters sent word to the Lord saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Now think about that for a minute. Why didn't they say hurry? He's sick. Or they could have said, he's critically ill. He may not live another day or so. They just simply say, as the scripture says, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. The word love there is interesting, too. It has the idea of not just the agapao love, but the thaleo love is involved, too that there was a closeness, a friendship to the two sisters and the brother. Possibly they said, well, the one you love is sick because they knew he didn't have to be there personally to heal him. He could just say the word. They, they knew about those things. Whatever the case, the Lord stated to his disciples that this sickness would be used to the glory of God. 
Now, they don't know what he's talking about. But, you know, a lot of times we may not know certain things. But God does. And even today, if I'll sermonize here a minute. When you obey the gospel from the heart, your past sins are remitted. The Lord adds you to his church. You're living faithful to the truth. I don't care how much New Testament you know and practice. There'll still be a lot of things that will not be clear because they're not revealed or else you need to grow more in that area. And a lot of things, they're just not meant to be revealed to us. As the Old Testament writer said, the secret things belong to God, but the things that are revealed to us and our children forever. So we don't know why some things, but we can always rest assured the Lord knows what he's doing. And he knew here. It involved a, a man who was a very good friend of his dying so that he could show forth the glory of God. Then he, he stays in that place where he heard about Lazarus' sickness for two days. However much suffering Lazarus underwent before he died, I don't know. May not have been much. May have been quite a bit. But he died. In order to do what the Lord planned out to do, Lazarus had died. And he died the way many people would from some sort of sickness. So there are times in life, regardless of how faithful you are, uh, you may end your life by being very sick for a long time. What we fail to do is realize that the things that are foremost too many times in our minds and burden us down is that we're in time and space and material things. And we're burdened by the way things work here. But that's not the way the Lord sees things. And it was true here. So after two days, he says to his disciples, uh, let's uh, go up to Jerusalem or Judea. Well, that was a little bit of seemingly a surprise to them because his disciples reminded him of the great danger that was awaiting him in Judea. But that didn't make any difference. Jesus said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But I go that I may awaken him out of sleep. Think for a minute. What is death to Jesus? We're going to see as we go on through this what it is to him. When the disciples thought that the Lord was talking about actual sleep, sleep of rest of the physical body and the brain, he had to come out plainly and tell them, Lazarus is dead. But notice what he said. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. Now that's interesting. I, who, Jesus Christ, concerning a good friend, I'm glad I wasn't there. And I've got you in mind as the reason I'm glad I wasn't there. And he says, it all has to do with building your faith so that ye may believe. I suggest there's a lot in that concerning why we undergo a great many things that seem so hard or think a great many things come upon us when we're trying as best we can to know and do what's right. I don't know how the Lord looks down upon each one of us individually, but I know he does. I know he personally attends to us. I know that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I know that as his children, he has great concern for each one of us. And when I look at this, 
I see that these things don't preclude me getting off of sick or being killed in some sort of accident. All a part of living here in the flesh. In this case, Jesus raises the curtain so we can see. And he says, this is all being done to strengthen the faith of the apostles. And then he ends up by saying, but let us go. Now, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived in Bethany, and Bethany was near to Jerusalem. If you were ever over there, it doesn't take long at all by car to uh, leave, go down the eastern side of the mountain there, and then go across the Kidron Valley and up the Mount of Olives and over to Bethany. So it says Bethany was near to Jerusalem, and many Jews were there. Well, why are they there? Well, they've come to console Mary and Martha. We understand that. We do the same thing. But now Martha hears that Jesus is coming, and she goes out to meet him. She doesn't wait till he gets there. She goes out to meet him. She knew what had been written to Jesus about Lazarus. And she said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. That's interesting. Because she knew he had the power from where he was to save him. Of course he had been there. Being the human being that he was, no doubt he would have gone ahead and saved him from sickness. But the Lord put a situation, set up a situation to where he wouldn't be there. He did it deliberately. He said he did. So even now, she said to him, I know that whatever you ask of God, he will give you. Her faith is not superficial and weak. And he responds in a very matter-of-fact way. Your brother shall rise again. Well, her mind's on the final resurrection at the end of the world. She says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Sometimes people try to say in the Old Testament, they didn't have a clear conception of uh, the end of the world in the last day. But obviously, she did. Now, he responds to her and he tells her, I am the resurrection and the life. I said earlier about Jesus bringing life into the world through the gospel, as Paul told Timothy. He said further, he who believes in me shall live, even if he dies. That's a physical death, of course. And he says, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Now, then notice what he does. He looks at her and he says, do you believe this? Well, I have to ask myself the question, do I believe this? The Lord's asking me the same thing. She's already a a follower, a disciple. Lazarus was too, and so was Mary. That doesn't mean her faith doesn't need to grow. And remember why he said that he was going there? Why he stayed away until Lazarus got so sick he died? So it would be good for the disciples, for their faith. Sometimes we just don't want to go through what it takes to make our faith stronger. Martha said, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are, notice, the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. It's amazing she knew far more than the doctors of the law and the Pharisees and the scribes. Just a few words it took for her to say those things. Well, after this, she goes away and she calls Mary saying, the master or the teacher is here and is calling for you. I think it's a song written that has that. The master's calling for you. Well, then Mary met the Lord in the same place where Martha had met him. And she falls at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, here's where you see the humanity of Christ, just like you and just like me, as far as his humankind. When Jesus, therefore, saw her weeping, 
and the Jews who came with her, also weeping. He was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. The Lord said, where have you laid him? They said, Lord, come and see. And the shortest verse, Jesus wept. Now, the kind of weeping that goes on here is like you and I would cry over something like this. When Jesus stood on the Mount of Olives and looked across at Jerusalem, he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them and are sent unto thee, how often would I gather you unto myself and as a hen gather their chicks unto her? And you would not. Now it talks about him crying there, but that was an inward crying, lamenting of the heart. But this is not. Jesus outwardly wept. He comes to the tomb. It was a cave, not unusual. It was a stone in front of the cave that uh, sealed it. And he says, remove the stone. And they still don't get it. We're like that a lot of times. But these are honest-hearted people. These are people doing the best they can with their understanding. And Jesus is long-suffering with them. And she says, Lord, by this time, that is Martha, he stinketh. The body's decaying. He's been dead four days. Always. I'm a bit amused by what Brother Marshall Keeble said years ago. He used the King James Version. He said, he stinketh. He said, now he could have used some other refined word. He said, no, he stinketh. He's good and dead. Well, that is a point. The body's already decaying. What difference did that make to Jesus? The Lord said to Martha then, did I not say to you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. So they removed the stone. Notice the prayer, and we're going to have to stop here. The Lord prayed to the Father. In that prayer, he expressed his concern that the people may believe that thou didst send me. And then he cries with a loud voice. Everybody around could hear him. Lazarus, come forth. Scripture says he who died came forth. He was still bound hand and foot as was the custom of the Jews in preparing a body to be buried. His face was wrapped, uh, his face was wrapped around with um, cloth. And Jesus simply said, unbind him, and let him go. We'll stop at this point and have prayer in just a moment, but I want to say there is the hope of all mankind. There's our hope. As Paul said, we're saved by hope. There's our expectation. And we will be able to hear the voice of our Lord when he says, come forth at the end of time. If we are dead at that time, how wonderful it would be to be alive when he comes, be caught up there, to meet him in the air. So be with the Lord forever with all the righteous. Question, why is this in your Bible? What did you get out of this when you read it? Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of the living God. The Apostle John writes this to prove it. Now, how would it be, how would a person even approach it to try to contradict these things? Well, they try, but they cannot do it successfully. Well, let's end here and have a word of prayer. Our Holy Father, we're thankful again for this great avenue of prayer. Thankful we can meditate on these words we've studied together this evening, that we will properly apply them to our lives, realizing the brevity and uncertainty of life in the flesh but realizing that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. We put our trust in him, the true gospel, and pray that we'll live by it daily, that we'll turn from all things that hinder us from doing so and serve thee until the end. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen.